Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Troll Plays podcast. We're here with Giga Ohm, and uh, we're doing the Tech on Fire series, which is very exciting, where we look forward into the future and look a little bit into the past as well. I'm delighted to be joined here from West Texas by Chris Grunderman. Hi, Chris. Hello. Hi. Very well. Good to talk to you today, Rose. Yeah, likewise, likewise. So um, you focus on networking. Do you want to give us a bit of your background? Because you've got an awful lot of experience. You know, we're, we're delighted to be speaking to you about the whole networking side of innovation and how we're seeing startups coming up in that space and what we have been seeing and what we're likely to see. But for anybody who perhaps has not had the pleasure of hearing you do one of your podcasts or spoken to you in the past, it'd be great to, to find out a little bit more about Chris. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so my, my background, I guess, is um, a network engineer by trade. Uh, I worked on some small ISPs in Colorado. A uh, wireless internet service provider was kind of where I cut my teeth and then worked on a network that's now part of NTT and worked on another big network that's now part of Lumen. Um, I also then uh, did some work in the cable industry. So at a, at a nonprofit called Cable Labs, which uh, holds the DOCSIS standards and they kind of do all the, all the development work on behalf of the cable industry and did that for a little while and was lucky enough to get my name on some patents while I was doing that and wrote a couple of books along the way. And then I spent a couple of years working with the Internet Society uh, and their goal is that the Internet is for everyone. And so I did a lot of traveling. Uh, I gave talks at network operator group meetings and other types of events around the world uh, in like 35 different countries. And then the last five or six years, almost seven years, I guess now, has been more focused on enterprise IT. So bringing that networking background as well into the data centers and into the campus networks, um, but then also looking at security and, and now more and more um, AI as well and how that uh, is going to play out in, in the IT world. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us, Chris. So we're looking, I mean, just to, to dwell a little bit more on what you've done. So you've been a network engineer and you've got eight patents or your code. Yeah, that's right co-named on a number of patents. Yeah, yeah. And also you're an author and you've also uh, been involved with an IETF RFC, I believe as well. That's correct, yes. I've done some work in the IETF, um, both uh, from the angle of Cable Labs and then later on through the Internet Society. Um, and so yeah, I do have one RFC out there with my name on it, which is cool. Yeah, got quite a badge of honor there. And yeah. um, you also podcast as well with a co-judge of ours, Stephen Foskett, around enterprise AI. So tell us, you know, network has come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, what do you think have been some of the most significant innovations sort of that you've seen in, in that? And obviously IP has become prolific over the last sort of 15, 20 years. But um, what are you seeing as having been sort of some of the the milestones, I guess, in networking over the last decade. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think you're right. I think that you know the, the just the proliferation of the internet and the internet protocol suite, right? TCP/IP and 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 how networking has gotten into kind of every facet of, of life mm -hmm. uh, is definitely a big part of that. And we've seen you know in, in large part that's happened in the last ten years, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, I like to say that you know kind of the the first thirty years of networking was was figuring out if it would work. And then we spent 30 years kind of making it work. And, and now we're in a phase, it seems that we're really working on, on how it works. And what I mean is it's all about quality of experience and ensuring that not just you have connectivity, but you have quality connectivity, right? Does, does this video show up clearly? Can I hear you? Um, can the applications I'm using work? And can they work from wherever I want to work? Uh, and, and all of that's obviously based on the network and the infrastructure underlying all of this IT. Um, and again, going into you know, facets of, of all kinds of modern life now. Yeah, well, it's certainly become a lot more important over the last 18 months or so, as a lot of us sure. have been relying on the internet to just go about our, our daily jobs. Um, so what have you seen that's been particularly insightful? I mean, you, you've talked about how ubiquitous it's become throughout all aspects of our lives, but what what's really allowed that to, to happen? Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, what have been the big steps, the big leaps forward that we've seen in networking? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. I think that, you know, one of the things is the still the basis is still a lot of hardware out there, right? And these switches and routers, which have grown up over time and, and obviously, you know, higher and higher bandwidth and, and, and larger chips and ASICs on those switches in order to allow higher bandwidths and lower latency and, and all of those things. Um, but I think a lot of what's happened in the recent, um, you know, last 10 years and, and especially now going forward is the aspect of software in networking. 
And so not just the operating systems that are running on those routers and switches, but more and more there's, there's software and programs up around it, right? So one example is SD-WAN, which I think has been a big um, kind, of, kind of game changer, I guess, over the last two or three, four years. Um, mm -hmm. Some folks started dabbling in it earlier than that. Now it's becoming fairly widespread. A lot of, a lot of enterprises are, are looking into an SD-WAN type solution. And what that basically does is, you know, is decoupling the control plane from that hardware plane so that I can have a cloud-based, you know, network operations software that runs this network. And one of the interesting things there, I think, is that a big part of what it's doing is, you know, making the internet part of folks' wide area network, right? And, and what I mean by that is in enterprise networking for a long time, you know, if you, if you rewind, it's probably even further than 10 years ago, but, you know, mm. back far enough, you really had servers in a closet, maybe, you know, at, at your office, you had people working at desks in their office, everything was connected together with Ethernet cables in that office. And you put a firewall on the internet connection and you built, you know, a private network to your data center. Um, and then eventually you moved those servers from that closet to the data center. But there was still this area where it was your infrastructure, right? It was a network that you had gone out and bought these pieces of hardware and, and these um, circuits and put it all together. And you really kind of had that ownership of this infrastructure. And now with the advent of cloud computing and virtualization kind of taking over, where we've moved a lot of applications, again, off those servers, we're no longer necessarily putting them into co-location facility and then not even, definitely not you know, on-premises at our own office, but we're connecting to the cloud, which is of course infrastructure we don't own. And we're connecting it to it over the internet, which is infrastructure we don't own. And so understanding how to you know, provide quality of experience over this infrastructure that you don't actually have total control over is a big part of, I think, what's going on right now. And that's happening in the networking world, but also in the security world as well, where you know, I just don't have that perimeter where I can lock the doors and, and, and everything's safe inside of that anymore because there really aren't any doors, right? People are working from wherever they might be at home, obviously lately, a lot more than they had in the past. And the applications they're connecting to are, are again, you know, out there on the cloud somewhere. They're either SaaS applications or applications running on infrastructure as a service on uh, in one of these big public cloud providers. So, I mean, you touched upon security there as being one of those elements. And certainly from, and I think previous discussions that I've had with some of your colleagues at Gigo is around the fact that, you know, security perhaps was one of the issues that held enterprises back mm. from the whole cloud engagement really so you know you'd put something that wasn't particularly important you know you pop it out on the cloud and everybody'd be happy about that then people start to say oh well you know are we opening ourselves up to stuff can we put you know there's performance there's security there's all of those elements and so what you're saying is this whole software defined aspect has helped people to be able to not just deal with the performance but also to to help allay some of the fears that there may have been around the security about using the cloud? Or do you think it's more than that? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. I think that, I think for sure there was, the security was a big piece of this um, mm -hmm. in, in moving things to the cloud. And, and there's still, you know, places and areas where you don't want to move things to the cloud for whatever reason. There are, you know, companies that are doing, you know, extremely uh, proprietary things that they want to keep on premises or, or they have some very specific requirements and they need to do that. Um, but in general, we have kind of built the tools to, allow most companies to be able to use the cloud um, in, in, in many cases. And definitely then um, that is, I think, leading to what, you know, if you look at like the trend of, of the SASE, which a lot of people are talking about these days, where we basically added all these security features onto an SD-WAN platform and now have this converged security and networking, um, which again, that leads to cultural shifts as well as technological ones, because, you know, the, you know, it used to be the security team and the network team where we're different folks with different skill sets and different budgets within a company a lot of times. And now that's all kind of being squished together. And again, yeah, so it's, it's interesting that I think the cloud is kind of the reason that this is all happening and also an enabling function of it, right? Because the reason that the, the model of SASE works is because I can put the security appliances in the cloud. And then of course they're accessible from anywhere. So people can be working from home or from a coffee shop or, or from wherever they need to be and still have all that full security. So we're really kind of allowing this secure and mobile workforce to take shape. And I think that, you know, we were lucky enough that a lot of that technology was in place and at least available, if not being totally used, um, you know, 18 months ago when, when, the, when the COVID pandemic started and has definitely taken off from there um, because it's, you know, such an enabling technology for this kind of, again, secure and mobile workforce, I would call it. Yeah. Um, interesting. You talk about the, the, the different teams and it being a cultural shift. Which do you think has been the bigger challenge for companies? Has it been the cultural shift or the technology shift? 
Well, I, I think they're really related. I think I think that the technology is is definitely, I think, causing these cultural shifts that are required. And and always, yeah, I mean, I think people tend to be um, the harder part of any change. Um, there's a lot of folks who learn to do something a certain way and then want to continue doing it. Um, there's, you know, those different lines of silos or whatever, you know, teams and, and those boundary lines have been drawn. And so figuring out how to work across those teams uh, is super important, right? I mean, one, one example um, is like, the virtualization that we did inside data centers with things like VMware or other technologies that then added network virtualization in there. And now you have this you know, portal that used to be just where folks who were running the servers and storage would go to, 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 to do things with their you know, storage and compute virtualization. And now you add networking into that and now you add security into that. And there becomes this question of, okay, well, who does what job now? Because the tools I used to use as a network engineer were just you know, maybe logging directly into the CLI of these switches. And now I've got a virtualized network layer, whether it's SD-WAN or something else inside of you know, the compute layer, where it's just it's a different tool set and, and it's a different mentality of, of how things work. Um, and so I think definitely, I think that's you know, a struggle and a challenge for a lot of folks. Um, and not just within networking and not even just in security, but, but broader, right? This whole shift to the cloud has definitely, I think, changed the way that a lot of IT operates and, uh, and we're still dealing with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think obviously, a lot of people had to accelerate their digital transformation. They had to get cloud quick, right? Not about yeah. get cloud, cloud first, it's cloud, cloud quick. Um, do you think that's had an impact on some of the other aspects? Because moving uh, speed doesn't always give people the time to really ensure that things kind of have everything in place. It's a little, I wouldn't say belt and braces, that's probably a little bit extreme because I'm sure it isn't that case, I hope. Um, but do you think that now is going to be a period uh, of now that it's been done, a lot of this has been done, uh, are we going to have to look at retrofitting some of the other aspects that maybe were like, oh, maybe we should have done that? Sure, I think so. I think there's, I mean, there's a constant evolution for sure. And I oh. think that, um, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done, just even in just the general kind of, you know, everything that's folded under this idea of digital transformation and, and understanding that, you know, today, almost every business um, is it's in some way a technology business and they may not directly be selling software or, or have an app necessarily, but, but a lot do. And a lot, even if that's not how you interact with customers directly, there's still all this stuff on the back end that is how you operate internally, right? Whether you're using, you know, some kind of CRM or some kind of messaging app or, you know, almost all of the um, email and calendaring and those kind of things have all kind of gone online into cloud services. Mm. And, but there's still a lot of work happening in refactoring of applications and then moving them there. And, and then, you know, again, kind of connecting these kind of traditional cloud and, or sorry, traditional campus and data center networks up to the cloud networks. And I think, you know, there's a big industry involved in, in doing that right now, right? So folks are, folks are building a lot more data centers with a lot more interconnectivity to be able to connect, you know, between data centers to campuses, to cloud applications, and, and have that all kind of work seamlessly. And so you've got, you know, new players in the space that are building networks um, that weren't, you know, ever something that was even imagined before um, in order to kind of en enable some of this, this massive interconnection between companies and, and between vendors and partners and, and all those things. Cool. Well, you give me a great segue there, Chris. Yeah. Uh, you talk about new players and clearly the Tech Trailblazers is all about the startup community, the innovation that you see in that environment. Um, so do you think this is a good time for the networking and perhaps other uh, startups who are maybe still quite fledgling or have an idea now that maybe is more pertinent because of the fact that we've got this much bigger, um, what's the best way to say? It? I want to say bigger embracing of the cloud. And yeah, that, that's probably the right word is people have, have kind of had to give it a really big hug and go, right, we're in on this one now. Um, is, it, is this a good time to be a networking startup? I think so. Yeah, I think again, you know, going back to that, you know, idea of of software kind of eating the world, and and it's definitely happening within networking as well. And because of that, right, you don't necessarily have to be manufacturing hardware in order to sell networking applications. Um, that wasn't always true, right? It used to be mm -hmm. really, you know, you know, you went and got an appliance when you needed whatever it was, whether it was a router, or a switch, or a firewall, or a load balancer, or something else. You went and bought, you know, some pieces of metal that were manufactured somewhere. And and now a lot of that can be done with with just software. And, and so that obviously opens the door for a lot more players to be able to come in um, and not have to, you know, spin up giant manufacturing processes. Um, I also think that, you know, to our points we've been talking about through this um, conversation already is so many things have changed and, and it is a very dynamic space, um, which I guess obviously, I mean, everyone's always talked about IT being something that changes often. Um, 
but I think we're, we're definitely seeing it on an unprecedented scale, right? And, and, and the, just the base architecture of how people connect things together is, is shifting. And that's all the way from, you know, what we talked about already, one area, SD-WAN, I think is an area where we saw some startups come in and, and some of that's already consolidated a little bit. Um, but now there's, you know, again, networking folks, working with security folks and security is becoming more important in all these things. And so there's all the pieces and parts that go into that SASE model we've talked about and whether that's a CASB or a secure web gateway or all, you know, all these things. Um, and then, you know, in the security space, it, it blows up even more, right? And there's, I think, a ton of, of players coming into cybersecurity right now in all kinds of different avenues to try and protect all these different ways of, of connecting and, and different places we have applications. And so, you know, web application firewalls and load balancers and that kind of stuff is definitely seen uh, a, a bit of a renaissance, I think. Um, and then you move into, you know, where we get into the, the nuts and bolts of like container networking and, and microservices, and we've seen service mesh come out. And I, and I think obviously almost, almost everybody in the service mesh space is a, is a brand new player to networking. Um, and they're writing an interesting line between, you know, between the software applications, the DevOps type folks and the traditional IT folks and how to create this, you know, secure network inside of these um, kind of um, container environments that are, that are moving and changing all the time. And so there's definitely a lot of different areas, I think, where there's great chance for startups who are being successful and who will be in the near future. Yeah, and I know certainly um, I think most of it, because we've only had containers as as a category for a number of years, because obviously yeah. it didn't exist right at the beginning of when we started. But I think most of those have either gone on to, well, I think that most of them have been acquired or are huge fundraisers. So, I mean, we've seen a lot of success from our, our winners over the years, but that, they've been unusually, like, consistently Oh, yeah. Big raise, acquisition, dum, dum, dum. So, I mean, you've talked about that um, and we've talked about where we've kind of got to, I suppose, right now. So what are you seeing? Where are we going to see the next steps? Are we obviously going to continue to see a lot of innovation in, in the areas you've discussed? Which are the really hot ones? Which are the ones that you would be very interested to be seeing how they play out over the next sort of few years? Yeah, so one thing we haven't talked much about is the infusion of artificial intelligence into these other mm -hmm. systems. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And so I think that's where a lot of innovation is going to happen in both networking and, and the security space is using, you know, the, the term AI ops is now becoming fairly common, uh, although it's, it, you know, the, the actual um, uh, systems that are doing it aren't quite um, all the way there yet, which I think is why there's a lot of room for innovation still is finding new ways to use these algorithms to you know assist us right and then really it's it's a co-pilot thing i don't think that we're going to see um you know completely self-driving networks where you don't need an operator at all um at least not for a very very long time um, but i think we will see more and more areas where the systems we're using are giving us helpful hints into what's going on if there's a performance problem that's lurking you know behind some fuzzy data or there's some trend line that's that's you know looks like it might do something bad in the next few days or a few weeks you're going to get these kind of more proactive alerts about what's going on in the network um, whether it's just, you know, quality of experience or connectivity issues, or again, the security piece. I think that is another piece that's going to be really big is that continuing convergence of networking and security. And I think it'll play out in different ways in different environments and in different industries, but I think we will definitely see and have seen security becoming more and more important in, in so many places, right? And that's true of application developers. We're talking about shifting security left, but it's also true in the network where um, just connecting the two wires together isn't enough anymore, right? It's really, we're looking at things like network segmentation and encryption everywhere. And then how do we make sure that that all works out? So I think those are two big areas, right? That, that AI coming in and helping us and, and security becoming in and, and, be, and becoming more pervasive inside the network um, are, are two of the biggest areas amongst some of the other ones we've already talked about. I couldn't agree more. I'm very excited to see what we're going to be having as um, entrance this year. So um, we talked about those elements. And I think, you know, the, the automation, the AI piece of, pretty much all of what we're seeing. We've seen a, a huge surge in the number of AI um, startups who are, are coming and knocking on the door. Um, and certainly they do tend to sort of fit with something else. So they, they may well have a security element to them. They may have a networking element to them. Um, so aside from those, I mean, one of the things that obviously I have talked about um, previously um, with some of your colleagues, but IoT as well, obviously not necessarily your your focus, but obviously that stuff that's network that network people responsible for networks have to think about. So, what are the challenges from a networking perspective on that side of things? 
Yeah, that is another big area. And I think, you know, obviously the first thing is just the sheer number of devices being connected to the network is, is growing astronomically, right? And so when you're talking about, you know, devices that are meant for a human to interact with the system, um, there's a limitation there by just the population. There's only so many devices you can carry around, right? There's only so many, you know, you might need a tablet and a phone and a laptop, but that's about the limit for most folks. But when you start talking about putting sensors onto everything, uh, obviously the, the numbers are just staggering. And so just, just the general being able to connect things is, is a big challenge there. And then um, obviously we've seen these new low power WAN um, protocols come out. Um, so LoRa is one, there's some others, there's some more proprietary ones, there's some other open ones, but you know, enabling these sensors to be able to send small amounts of data at, at really low um, bandwidths to keep the power envelope really, really small so that these sensors can live. You know, the goal, right, is to have these watch battery type devices out there in the field for up to 10 years um, because you don't wanna have to be going out and replacing these things all the time. And, and you can't have them, you know, plugged into real power all the time if they're, you know, if they're monitoring the temperature of a package in a frozen truck, uh, it needs to be able to move around and move from truck to truck. And so it's gotta be running on battery power. And so being able to do that is, is super important as well. So between just the number of devices and, and the types of environments they're in. I think those are definite networking challenges that are being uh, addressed right now. And that's, that's a really interesting new space. We're, we're digging into it actually pretty deeply at, at GigaOM and um, it's emerging, right? I mean, it's, it's happening right now. And it's, it's, it's uh, one of the most fun things I get to do is try to tease out what that's actually gonna look like um, because I think it's not quite clear yet. There's a lot of players with overlap and, and people figuring out where their niche is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the challenge, isn't it? And also for the people who are gonna buy it, because I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. The people who tend to to buy the research that you're you know you're involved with and you write are the people who are trying to make those purchasing decisions, right? Yeah, right. So I bet neither of us are going. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to do that job because that sounds like a <laughs> nightmare over the next decade. So what would be um, what do you think they're looking for? What's going to be key for them? Um, particularly, let's say from a startup's perspective, what's going to help? shift the needle for them because it's always a big step isn't it i mean enterprise technology you know when you're responsible for that there's an awful lot of things with price tags that you already have to pay for right mm -hmm. you know the basics right so despite the fact we're talking about how great it is to have innovation and it's wonderful and it's a great opportunity for startups but at the end of the day someone's got to buy this stuff right because you can get as much vc funding as you like but at the end of the day somebody has to have a need for it somebody has to have a problem that they're willing to part with that their hard-earned budget or the company's hard-earned budget and there will be a lot of pressure in those purses right now because mm -hmm. um, people are trying to save money so how do you stop being seen as a cost you know how do you take what your new shiny networking innovation is and turn that into something that somebody at an enterprise level is going to be wanting to buy or feeling that they have to buy what's going to be you know what's going to be the silver bullet for that yeah I mean, that's a really good question um i mean my, my most basic advice there is, is a lot like the stock tip which is to to, to buy low and sell high and, and what I mean is, you know, the, the key really, I think, is you, you, it, it needs to not be a cost center, right? So you need to be uh, finding a way to save that person money, make them money, or lower their risk. And, and really, you, I think you've got to do one of those three things for a business um, to be able to, you know, gain customers. Obviously, that's very reductionist and, and pretty simple and, and probably straightforward. Uh, but I do think that that's going to be the key is looking at ways where, you know, what is the actual bottom line business change that I can enable with this technology? Because to your point, right now is not an environment, and it rarely is an environment where I can just throw money at, at toys, right? And so I really need to talk to folks about that that business change, right? And so um, I think you know security is definitely something that's changed. The dialogue around security has changed drastically in the last ten years, and I think it will continue to over the next ten years. And so that's an area where you know by by mitigating that risk, you're actually saving a company potentially a lot of money. And so th those are ways to get in there. On the networking side, again, it's you know what is this transformation that this business is going through and how can I support that? And, and again, either, either help them make money or, or help them save money. And, and whether that's, you know, higher efficiency because I'm putting sensors on all the devices in a factory. And so now I can tell when they're about to break down. Um, that's a really good reason to spend some money in that factory, right. And, and get higher efficiency levels and, and get um, mean time to repair down lower and, and things like that. So I think it's, it's, it's really about tying it to the business. Mm. I mean, when people pitch their technology to you, because obviously people want you to know what's mm -hmm. happening, how do you think we're faring with this in the startup world when you speak to technologists who have 
a new innovation or perhaps an innovation which isn't 100 new but it's a different take on something that's already out there yeah are they getting it right are they able to to express themselves in that sort of way that can resonate to the yeah. enterprise bar, you know it buyer i've definitely some do i i don't think it's true across the board um i think that there is um some innovation that's, that's happening today that's that's almost innovation for innovation's sake and, and is looking you know is, is our solutions looking for problems um but i do think that for the most part um most folks are coming at this from an area of you know they see an actual need and, and are trying to fill it um so i think in general i think most people are getting it right um of course that needs to be fine-tuned over time because um those stories are going to change right as the environment around it changes so um i think generally though yeah most folks are, are, are tapping into these you know, key trends and and doing a fairly good job of them connecting that back to to the actual business need. Yeah, I think that's also helps that a lot of them have to pitch to the VC community. So they have to keep things fairly sort of high level on some and, and focus on those business needs because you can't guarantee that somebody's going to give you money is going to fully understand the pain points. So you need to be able to express those. You know, what is the pain of your customer and how do you alleviate that pain? Yeah, that's very true. So, you know, we talked a little bit about AI. I mean, is that a bit of a silver bullet for this type of thing? Because AI feels like it helps save money. Now, everybody obviously gets a little bit nervous about that because it sounds like, oh, we're going to lose headcount. We're going to, you know, is, is that really true? Because a lot of people I speak to in, in that enterprise IT environment are saying, well, that's, it's not really the case. It's more about doing the more mundane stuff that, you know, somebody would just be beating their head against the wall if they had to do it day in, day out, or being able to do more stuff that just isn't humanly possible because you're dealing with, you know, a, a, an attack surface, a threat uh, landscape, for example, in security, that's just so vast that you couldn't possibly, you, they just pick up the anomalies and then somebody kind of like sifts through that, who can give the human eye and the experience to that, oh, that doesn't look quite right, that's been popped up. Would you say that's correct? I do. I, I do think that's right. I think that, you know, automation in general and, and an artificial intelligence and, and, and down into the machine learning and, and neural networks is kind of the, the, the deepest areas of, of automation. Uh, it is a big thing. And I, I don't think we're talking about um, anybody really losing their jobs over it. And, and what I mean is there's so much work out there to be done now, as we've been talking about, right? All these trends we've been talking about, about you know, the internet and networking becoming more and more of every business and, and digital transformation and, and security becoming more important. Um, the, the number of connected devices is growing. The number of people using these things is growing. The importance of it to the business is growing. And so, you know, at this point, really, really good automation working everywhere is, is just helping us stay afloat, um, right? So, so I think it is, it does potentially save costs in that you maybe don't have to hire a ton more people, um, but there's already more work than, than we have skilled people for. Um, and so giving them the best tools possible to your point to kind of take some of that day-to-day -day, um, mundane tasks off their plate and let them do the more big picture thinking uh, is, is absolutely helpful and is needed. And, uh, and, I, and I don't think we should be too worried about it as far as uh, job security in, in IT. Yeah, there definitely seems to be, there's always been discussion about the skills gap and we don't seem to ever quite be able to kind of make it any smaller. In fact, I think we're possibly making it larger because obviously the diversity of what we can do now uh, from a tech perspective is just keeps growing and keeps growing. I mean, do you think that that actually automation will buy us the time to get that skill gap, skills gap addressed? Because it will allow us to perhaps encourage people to to take on some of these more exciting roles and more creative roles and more where you perhaps move more rewarding roles yeah yeah i think it will I, I think i think it has to um i think that we need um this level of automation to to stay as caught up as we are now and, and not fall further behind to your point um i and i think that um we'll do the best we can with it as an industry and uh, i think there's still i don't know that we're i don't know that we're going to see like the, the skills gap go away, right? I think that for a long time, definitely if we're talking about the, you know, the last 10 years versus the next 10 years, I think for the next 10 years, we will still see um, network and security job postings go unfilled for, for long periods of time because there's just not enough people to do the amount of work that's needed right now. Um, and so, yeah, so these tools are, are going to be the, the thing that helps us get through that. Mm. And I always think the problem is that the skills keep moving forward and we can never quite keep <laughs> <move> up. <laughs> yeah. We're like chasing, chasing behind the curve of what's needed, 
risk yeah. of what is actually humanly possible to keep getting people to to learn so, so um you know we've talked about the networking side of things a lot of the you know the good stuff that we're seeing where do you think we're not seeing innovation that we should be seeing are there any gaps you know we talked about the skills gap have we got a technology gap as well yeah um that's a really good question i i don't know that i i can think of an area where you know i see a real big need that's not being filled at, at the moment i think that um one area that doesn't get maybe enough attention not necessarily from a from a startup kind of provide, producing a product point of view but just from a mind share of the industry point of view is you know the dirty little secret about software uh, is that it all runs on hardware and and i think that we've definitely kind of seen a shift in what most people understand as what it infrastructure is and so you know there's a lot of folks who are maybe coming into it jobs now they're maybe in their 20s and just got out of college and and their job as an it infrastructure engineer is to work on aws mm -hmm. um which is great and is needed uh, or, or azure or gcp or, or oracle or whatever right where they're working on some public cloud where they're basically just interfacing with a software interface that can you know do use all this virtualization to give them the infrastructure they need um, but they have no exposure to the servers or storage arrays or routers or switches or firewalls or the actual hardware that lives underneath that and so we may actually be making this a, a new and, and worse skills gap where that kind of base level infrastructure uh, the actual like connecting the switches together and connecting the routers together and knowing how that stuff works um is is something that you know I, I am concerned that we could fade away from that too much and that there's going to be less people available to do that kind of work than there has been in the past because we're looking at infrastructure from a different layer now yeah well i think parents will understand that is when you try to explain what a landline is like, yeah. what is that that doesn't you don't need that you've got a mobile why would you need something that's plugged into the wall right, right. um yeah i think that's an interesting aspect it's certainly something i think we need to bear in mind there's something about actually knowing that there are flashing lights, there are cables coming out the back of Vox, um, and there's stuff happening sort of physically somewhere that, you know, is powering what you're interfacing into. Cool. And anything else? Now, there was one thing that we haven't yeah. talked about, which I was a bit surprised we hadn't. So I'm just going to put that out there. We've already put out IoT stuff, and it kind of relates, I think, to a degree, but the edge, mm. talking about edge networks sort of, you know, core versus edge, you know, and how we've kind of developed these sort of subsections within the networking world. Do you think the edge is going to be where it's at? Not in a U2 sort of way, but just generally speaking. Yeah, well, I, so I think it depends on what you mean by the, I think, I think generally, yes, ish. Um, but, but that's because, you know, the edge is, is wherever it is. And, and I mean, maybe that's silly, but, um, you know, there are lots of different edges, um, I think. And so, you know, there's one way to look at kind of the edge, which is pushing applications as close to users as possible to reduce latency. And that's been kind of the job of what a lot of content uh, distribution networks did in the past, just for content, right? So if you're streaming a movie or something, um, it's being streamed as close to you as possible. And now I've seen those companies are definitely kind of, you know, adding new features and functionality to actually run more um, developed applications at the edge and not just streaming content. And so that's one area, right? And then there's another piece where that's definitely happening in the mobile edge, where we're actually pushing this out into the, the, the close to the cell sites themselves. Um, and so that, from that perspective, right, that edge is, is really about lower latency, right? And so better performance for, for users. And, and that is actually, again, part of what's, you know, enabling some of these other technologies we've, we've been talking about, right? The, the, the cloud security things that are happening, those happen at the data center or pop closest to you. Um, to lower your latency. And they have to happen in a lot of areas so that you can move around and, and have a distributed company. Um, so yeah, and, and, and then, you know, and then it, it does tie in with the IoT stuff as well, right? So for example, again, if we are talking about the sensors in the factory, I may very well want to run a mini data center um, in that factory to be able to grab the raw data from all of the sensors and cameras and things right there live, run some artificial intelligence algorithms against it to understand what's going on and, and not necessarily transport that up to a uh, public cloud or, or or a big data center somewhere else, and I want to do that locally, and then only store the things that I need to store um, somewhere else, or do processing somewhere else if I have to. So I think we'll see um, a lot of different development in the edge, whether that's again the edge data centers that are kind of where the CDNs are working, or the mobile edge where the mobile operators are doing this, or or like I said, I think some companies will actually be going kind of backwards in that in that history we talked about, where they're actually going to be putting servers kind of back in the closet so that they can do um, you know uncompressed um, research on on their data. 
Mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, but that's to do with bandwidth and speed and, you know, efficiency again, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Fantastic. So, you know, we've looked back over the networking and touched on, well, quite extensively on security and AI and, and looked at that in the future. Is there anything else that you're kind of excited to be seeing what will happen over the next few years, the next decade? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the, the summary there for me from like an operator perspective, from a practitioner perspective, is just the enhanced levels of visibility and control we're getting. And so whether that's just from advanced telemetry or we're actually putting AI into the system or, or whatever we're doing, you know, there's more and more um, opportunity to actually understand what's going on at a really granular level and have control mm -hmm. over it. And, and so that I think is, is, is kind of across the board, a, a great thing that I'm seeing um, that will continue to advance and, uh, and should move the industry forward. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It's been really insightful to share, you know, half an hour or so sort of discussing these aspects. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting time. So really appreciate you sharing some of your insights. I'm sure we'll get to read about more of them over the next sort of 18 months, because I understand yeah. you guys are going to be very busy sharing. We are that uh, through reports and all that so thank you so that's Chris Grunemann he is with GigaOM and he's an analyst specializing in networking but very much involved in security and AI as well my name is Rose Ross and I'm with the Tech Trailblazers and this has been a Tech on Fire podcast with GigaOM thank you Chris really appreciate your time thank you this was fun all right then speak to you soon take care Cheers. now